start and then we'll dial it in. Okay. Um, hi. I can only see some of you, the people in the center. Those of you on the edges, you're completely washed out. I'm sorry. Um, just so you know. Um, so I want to talk about uh, web design and what's sort of emerging in web design and cool stuff we can do. So let's do that. Um, to a large degree, I'm hoping that people have questions and comments and pushback and stuff like that. Because um, I'll be honest, I do a lot of speaking. And rarely do I see a crowd as uh, cutting edge as this one. Let me put it that way. So, um, you know, if this, if this turns into us just sort of talking about this, awesome. But I have prepared stuff in case you all just want to sit there. That's fine, too. Um, so let's see. The, uh, the first thing that I wanted to sort of talk about is fun stuff you can do with uh, markup structures that you might not have uh, otherwise considered using. So as an example, and it'll be very interesting because uh, this is, as you can see, Firefox 3 beta 5. And I'll be very interested to see what it does to my examples. Um, so here I have a bar graph, which if I turn off the CSS, turns out to be a table, just a simple HTML table. Um, and there, let me bring that back. So there, that's taking a table, turning it into a bar graph, which you know we, I, we could edit, or I could edit, because you know, I'm up here. There's the markup. That'll probably be easier to read that way. There's really all there is to it. That's the whole document. Obviously missing the style sheet. I have a style sheet somewhere else. Um, and this, is, this can be a little weird to someone who's used to sort of traditional styling and traditional markup because typically when we think of a table, we think of a grid that sticks together as a grid. And when you, when you change the width of one cell, then it changes the widths of all the cells in that particular column. Or you change the height of a cell, it changes the heights of all the cells in that particular row. And everything kind of sticks together, and there's never any blank space between the edges of elements. But as uh, just to pick an example here, each of these um, vertical boxes is a TR element, which is a table row. And inside of it, these are the two TD elements. So it's, it's cells, which means that there's all this blank space between the edges of the table cells and the edges of the row that contain them, which is illustrative of one of those basic points of CSS that gets missed a lot which is that CSS doesn't care what you think elements should look like. It doesn't care what you think elements should do. Okay? The fact that, there's, that most of us have an internal model of what a table should do, irrelevant from a CSS perspective. Um, and in fact, of course, you can take that same thing and turn it on its side using, in this case, an alternate style sheet. Same markup, just switch the style sheet. And let's see here. OK, that's what I figured. So everything's driven by the CSS, including things like the heights of the bars. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting, because CSS, sadly, does not have expressions. So I cannot say things like height, uh, whatever the number in the cell is, divided by this other number. Um, I can't do that. But I can express them all as percentages, and then pre-compute that either on the back end of the server. Because I presume that if someone does something like this, it's going to be coming, drawing data out of a database through some kind of templating system, let's say, oh, I don't know, PHP. And so in the PHP, you could construct the CSS along the way to say, OK, this is the number I pulled out of here. And this, I know what this number corresponds to. And so I'll do my math that way. The other way to work it, of course, is to not assign that stuff in your static CSS and do it through JavaScript computation. Like spit the table out, have everything for styling the table except for these heights, and then have JavaScript loop through the table, pick up each of the numbers, and calculate the height and assign it through the DOM. Either one works. Um, I find it easier, though, to do stuff statically because then I don't have to try to trace through the, the operations of a DOM script. But um, if one of these numbers were to change and it needed to be 49.5% instead of 
what it was, then that's all there is to it. Which, of course, then leads us to the possibility of all kinds of Ajaxy goodness where each of these things is draggable, and as you drag it, the number changes and all kinds of fun stuff. You yeah, knock yourself out. I'm not going to do that here. Okay. So, and again, everything about this, just about, is um, driven by, is driven out of the table markup. There is an exception, which I'm going to show in a minute. And I'm actually going to open this up and let's see if I can re reveal the drag thing. I'm going to open this up in Camino because it is not a beta. And show that, you know, basically the same thing happens. Oops, down boy. All right, so um, even these guys right here, this, these are the table header cells in the first row of the table. This box, by the way, is the table itself. But again, from a CSS point of view, it doesn't matter that you think that one element is supposed to nest inside of another visually just because it's nested structurally. Um, to get those guys to hang out the outside, um, I took the, uh, the TR element that's in the, in the T head of the table, shoved it all the way over 100%, left 100%, so that its left edge basically lines up with the right edge of the table, and then gave it some extra left-hand margin to push it even further. So the T head actually ends up outside of the table element, element in terms of layout. Let me, oops, toss an outline on this guy. So we can see where it is. Okay, there's one of the TRs of the table sitting outside of the table. Woo! Okay, and then there's the THs inside of it. That's about it. Um, all of this stuff is done with positioning, as I'm sure those, those of you with any familiarity with CSS, just looking at this, could see that it was done with positioning. The, uh, the four quarterly rows, now let me scroll that up. The four rows that correspond to the four quarters, which are appropriately ID'd or just given consistent uh, styles and then given appropriate offsets to the left. Sorry, to the left. <laughs> um, and that's how, they, that's how they line up. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that, that, you know, you might look at this and say, that's really nice, but I notice you're doing this in a beta. And yeah, okay, you loaded it in Camino, which is not in beta. But uh, I have users that are using older browsers. Um, and that's okay because this actually works uh, as far back as IE6. Uh, the one thing that you would have to watch out for if you were to load this particular demo directly into IE6 is that uh, in order to get these cute little fades, because I was looking at Excel um, when I was doing this, in order to get these fades I used alpha channel PNGs, which IE6 does not support. So the backgrounds end up looking like crap in IE6, but the layout is the same. Um, so, you know, if you had to worry about that, you could drop the PNGs. It doesn't change anything. You just don't get quite the same little gradient effect deal going on. Um, and you could use GIFs if you wanted, but, you know, here they are. Literally, they're just alpha channel shadows over background colors, which I did because if I ever decided, yeah, I don't really like that particular shade of whatever that is, and I want it to be DOA instead, you know, I get the, get the shadow over the <laughs> purple. If I ever go to work for Smuckers, that'll be what I'll, the color I'll use <laughs> right there. Um, and again, you know, this part's fairly straightforward. Any element that has a class of scent gets that, uh, S-E-N-T, gets that particular color. So the, the legend updates itself along with the rest of the chart. That's normal stuff, but kind of cute. Okay, so let me pull that outline uh, out of there and put everything back to the way it was. Uh, let's see. It took me a long time to learn the basic principle that underpins this, which is the one that I stated before. CSS does not care what you think an element should look like or what an element should do. Uh, literally nine years of working with CSS before that really sunk in. In fact, uh, the first iteration of this particular thing didn't use a table for markup. Uh, if I remember correctly, I was nesting divs and classing and IDing them. 
Um, and then at some point, I, I looked at it and I said, nesting divs. What kind, of, what kind of markup crap is that? I've got divs everywhere. Nothing means anything. Clearly, these are nested lists. Um, swear to God, that's what I thought. Um, where each quarter was a list item, and then inside of that list item, there was a heading that had the Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and then below that was a nested list that had the sent and the, and the, you know, the, the invoiced and paid bits. Great, now it's more semantic. I have nested lists. And then, after that, somehow, I, I made the associative leap to say, wait, this is a table. Why am I doing this as list? This should be a table, because when I turn off CSS, when, you know, or if I don't have any CSS, oops, I missed. Not very good with a trackpad. I should really have columns and rows, right? If for no other reason than if I'm ever going to do this in, in, in the public view and someone uh, who is blind is using a speaking browser and is going through this, they're going to be really a lot happier with me using a table, actually. Because if we go to the markup, and let's see if I still have that window open. Yay. Because I've used the scope attribute, Scope equals row for the row headers, and okay, scope equals call for the column headers, which you can't see here at the moment. Um, because I'm doing that, there we go. Scope equals call. So scoping that header to the column it's in, and then the other scope to the rows. Then a sufficiently advanced speaking browser will actually read those, those, the content of those cells before the content of I'm sorry, the content of those headers before it hits the contents of the cells. So instead of just reading sort of in a linear, dumb fashion through the entire thing by saying invoice collected, Q1, dollar sign, 18,450, you know, whatever it says for the numbers, it can actually pull those in again. It, it, might, it might go through and say quarterly results, invoice collected, Q, Q1, and then invoiced, Q1, $18,450, collected, Q1, $16,500 because of those attributes. Now, if I'd done this as a nested list, like I, I was so proud of myself for thinking of doing instead of the nested divs, yay me, um, I either would have had to repeat that content in every list item, or else not have it, and therefore not provide it to people who might need it. And again, you know, this way you can have the, the, the presentation and still have it be structural. Now, this is where those numbers after the table come in. When I had the CSS turned off, you had the numbers up here, and then down below it there was this unordered list that had numbers. That's to do these little tick mark guys here, which, granted, from an Edward Tuftian point of view, is chart junk, but again, I was looking at Excel. So that's what those guys are for. I, I couldn't come up with a way to, to generate those. Well, I couldn't come up with a way to include that information in the table and have it make any sense at all. So I stuck it as a list afterwards and figured that if I were ever actually going to do this in the public view, I would probably generate those using JavaScript. You know, I'd do some DOM hacking. In the actual source of the page, this stuff would not appear. And if I, you know, if I weren't going to drop it, if I were going to keep it, I would actually generate it programmatically. Uh, probably with, with JavaScript, so that um, that way I would stand some chance of not having to write it out in cases where I didn't need it, and hopefully not write it out for people who are using speaking browsers. Um, because frankly, if I had a bunch of these tables on a page, or a bunch of these charts on a page, <laughs> the terminology gets a little weird because they're both, um, and I were using a speaking browser, and after every chart I had to sit through being read out the five tick mark levels, I would eventually try to find myself and kill myself um, in that case. So that's where I'd go with that. Clear enough? I hope. Yeah. Any questions? How does the um, mm -hmm. gradient uh, background work? I mean, where does it go? Is it uh, horizontal all the way across the bottom? Actually, no. I should have done that but I got lazy. <laughs> Let's go back to, let me go back to the vertical. Um, what I have, well, 
Actually, let me load the PNG. Why don't I just show you the PNG? That'd be a good idea. Um, so there's, you can sort of see it here. Um, and that just tiles horizontally across the element. Um, and that's, like I said, literally it's, it's just a PNG with an, I mean, it's a, it's a PNG, and if you took away the alpha channel, it would just be the flat gray, but it alphas itself away, and then that way I can just lay it over whatever color I'm using. For the horizontal, I should have that produced <laughs> fades going this way, but I didn't, so like I said, I got lazy. Um, yeah. Now, the fact that the tick marks don't show up in this view, I'm not sure, because again, new version of browser. Um, it did in the old version. But that doesn't bother me so much because, like I said, it is kind of chart junk and I probably shouldn't have done it in the first place. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to chalk this up to the browser knowing better than I do what I should be doing and, and helping me out. I didn't see if there was another hand over here. Because I'm going to sort of do a similar thing. which is something I did recently, more recently, which is I created a timeline out of a table. Uh, I, had, I did a talk a couple years ago at South by Southwest about the fact that CSS was 10 years old, and so um, I wanted to do this timeline of browser releases that were important to CSS. And uh, I did it in Keynote, because I couldn't think of another way to do it. Um, this was, and then it was only later that I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I could just take a table that had all this information in it, you know, the various browsers and the, and the release dates uh, by year. Whoops. Sorry. And turn that into a timeline. And in fact, make it a timeline that has some degree of interactivity to it. Um, just by using simple hovers and then if we scroll over, we keep going. Um, this is, you know, so you saw, since you saw the last one, the markup here probably isn't going to surprise you too much. And here is, for example, Internet Explorer for the Macintosh. Okay. Um, that has THs and fun stuff like that. And then one TD, one, one cell for each year. And uh, inside of it, any particular releases that happen to come out that year. The markup choices in there are not necessarily the best. I, I mean, I use paragraphs, which makes sense as long as, well, it sort of makes sense. But then it starts to make a little less sense anytime I have two releases in the same year. Maybe I should do these as lists. But on the other hand, most of my lists would only have one list item. And if there's one semantic construct that really bugs the crap out of me, it's single list item lists. <laughs> I just... I can't help it. Um, so, you know, I, spans maybe or, did, you know, I couldn't really come up with anything. I mean, in, an, in a totally perfect, ideal W3C utopian world, I would just invent my own XML vocabulary here, right, and style it, which I could probably do in Firefox um, or, for, or, or Opera, but would be tougher in things like Internet Explorer. Not necessarily impossible, but tougher. The interesting bit here, as far as I'm concerned, well, this might be interesting too, depending. Of course, since I did it horizontally, I had to do it vertically. You know, why not? Um, which led to some interesting design choices of, the, of, of their own. Um, but it was really just a case of fiddling with the, you know, where before I said top, then I had to say left and vice versa. Um, and actually, one of the things that's nice about this particular approach as opposed to the uh, what I had before. It, what, remember, I was using Keynote. And actually, when I first published this online, I went into Keynote, and I took screenshots of my Keynote slides. And then I sliced up each year in Photoshop. And then I put them all together as a bunch of GIFs, and that really felt dirty. Not to mention, if I ever like discovered that oh, geez, actually, you know, this particular browser came out in June 2000 instead of July. I thought it was July, but it was actually June. Then I would have to go into Keynote and, like, move the thing over and figure, you know, get it in exactly the right place and then slice that particular, you know, take a screenshot of that and slice that particular year out again. Geez, what a nightmare. Not to mention, you know, new browsers do on occasion come out. 
Um, so with this one, it's much nicer because I can say something like September 2008 for Internet Explorer 8. I have no idea if that's when it's coming out, okay? Um, that's, that's no kind of announcement or anything I wouldn't know anyway. But adding it, there it is. It just showed up in 2008, and there it is in September. And for that matter, you know, I could say, hmm, okay, Opera 9.5 might be out by July. And so I'll just toss that in here. And ditto Firefox 3. Maybe they'll be out by August. I, who knows? Uh, let's see. Where's the Firefox row? It's right here. Toss that in. Hit save. Hit reload. Bing. Yay. And then, of course, uh, if that actually changes, then all I have to do is change the information, which leads me to a point that I wanted to make, which is that um, those of you who have familiarity with CSS may have started to think to yourself, wait a minute, there are no classes. There's no, how is he indicating where these things should go? The answer is I am using the titles. Because if you go into the CSS, uh, this is the horizontal one, so let me get that one. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff, and you know I, we're not going to get to go through it all. But here's how I'm determining the positioning of these paragraphs within their particular years using attribute selectors on the title attribute in place of classes. Now, if I, if I could have gotten away with that on the years, um, I probably would have. But um, the problem was that, where did they go? Um, I started to run into uh, hovering conflicts, uh, specifically tooltip conflicts where I would be in a year and like tooltips would fight with each other. So um, like for example, when I'm hovering over this particular thing, I get Netscape Navigator because that's the title for this particular row. Right, this is the TR, by the way. Um, and then if I, if I put titles on each of the years, then I would never see that. I would only ever see what year I was in. And I didn't really, that wasn't really what I wanted. So I stuck with classes, and because classes can't start with numbers, I had to put a Y in, each, in front of each one. I mean, what are you going to do? Anyway, going back to this CSS. Oh, let me get rid of that window so that it doesn't keep confusing me. This is something that we can do now, thankfully, because IE7 supports attribute selectors. Um, so, you know, it, the, the same information that I wanted in there anyway in the titles so that I could get tooltips on hover, I can just use that for my styling, okay? Which is pretty cool um, because before, the, before I would have had to have the title and then I would have had to do something like class November Y 2005, or at least class equals November, just to make that happen, which strikes me as being somewhat redundant. And I'm doing the same thing for styling each of the individual rows. Instead of classing them by whatever browser is in there, I'm just keying off of the title. Here we go. I'm doing that down here. Uh, and for that matter, these, these uh, icons at the end, those are actually background images. The ones at the, at the uh, up here are actual IMG elements um, with the appropriate title. But over here, they're, they're background images. And I'm dropping those in again, keying off of the title attributes. Woo! How, uh, how far back will that sheet degrade? Uh, sorry. Um, what do you mean, how far back will it like, degrade? To what browser version? Well, in, I, in, in Internet Explorer, it's going to be IE7. IE6 isn't going to be able to handle this. Okay. Um, the the, the uh, attribute selection. The, the raw, the sort of the, the raw layout, probably okay with. Um, although, honestly, I haven't tested it. Um, when it comes to other browsers, uh, probably back to at least here. Um, because, I mean, Opera's had, it, had this stuff for a while, Firefox, Safari. And it's actually interesting. I hadn't realized that Firefox 0.8 came out after Safari 1.0. There you go. Until I, put the, until I put this timeline together. I mean, I'm sure I was aware of it at the time. But, you know, now, looking back, I was like, wait, is that right? And went back and double-checked it. And, yeah, it turns out to be right. Um, 
when browsers were discontinued, again, I keyed that off of the, where to go? The fact that the title would have the word discontinued in it. Oh, wait, I should scroll that up. Sorry. And then gave it slightly different styles. Uh, and so in the same way, these guys that I filled in here with my, my rectal statistics as to when these particular browsers will come out this year, um, I can key off of those as well by using another kind of attribute selector, which is a substring selector, where basically I say any, uh, any, any um, title, any paragraph with a title attribute that, whose value has a substring of stimated, because I didn't, wasn't, gonna, wasn't sure if I was always going to remember to capitalize the E or not, and these are case sensitive matches, um, put in a different uh, background image and change the color. Um, lighten them up a little bit. And then for that matter, um, yeah, well, I could do whatever. And then while I'm at it, since we have generated content now, toss a little uh, question mark in after the version number through the CSS like that. Now this is not going, this, this last part, this adding the question mark, will not work in IE7. But it will, we are promised, work in IE8. Yeah. And the fact that IE8 builds have passed the ACID2 test means that they must be supporting generated content, which is what that is. So there is hope. Um, but at the same time, this is one of those things that, that I sometimes refer, well, it, not just me, but people refer to as a progressive enhancement, which is if I were to load this up in IE7, which doesn't support generated content, no question mark. Not a big deal, right? Yeah? Now I see for the discontinuation of a browser, now you see IE697 is two different browsers. Um, why would you start IE7 at 7.0 in 2006? Uh, because I, Internet Explorer for Windows 6.0 came out in 2001. Oh, sorry, that's Internet Explorer for the Mac. Ah, okay. Wasn't clear about that. That's the subtly different logo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, and if I'd, ever, if I'd ever hovered over it, the tooltip would have told you as well. Um, yeah, as I, I, I have considered putting like a little Windows logo in a little Apple at some point. So that was, that was more user design flaw on my part. Um, and because, and these, these show the quote unquote official end dates. This uh, June 2003 uh, is when Microsoft just sort of announced without telling the Mac IE team that Mac IE was done. Um, and then this is, here you have February 2008 for Netscape. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there you go. Yeah, They came out with 9.0 at the end of last year and then immediately shut it down. I don't know, whatever. Go AOL, you rock. Um, and for that matter, if I did, you know, now that I've done this, I might th think to myself, hmm, you know what? The question mark's nice and all, but it shoved the alignment off because now I've got this dot and it's not lining up here. So it's just, this has just now occurred to me, so let's find out if this works. Um, So let's see. Hmm. Hmm? Yeah, okay. I, I can try an entity. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad someone suggested that because if you hadn't, I would have invented an excuse to do it. Um, you can't generate markup or entities. They are passed through, untouched. Okay, so generated content won't let you do that. For that, you're going to need to go back to the DOM. I mean, yeah, I could, I could do this. Or um, if I could remember, well, I mean, for that matter, I could do this. I'm sorry, what was that? How about the Unicode for non-breaking Yes. Space? Do you remember the Unicode for non-breaking space? No. Yeah, me either. That's the problem. <laughs> if, I, if I thought of this ahead of time, then I could say, aha, and I happen to remember. The, yeah. But yeah, if you can throw in and I, you know, something like X 
32 or something. That's probably going to get passed through. Yeah, say it got passed through. But there's there's a way to do it. And oh, okay, I came up with two. Yes. Okay, hang on. I have no idea what that is, but let's find out. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Someone call Hamzy Smatter. I wonder what that means. <laughs> It would be so awesome if it meant hope, wouldn't it? That would be great. i got to look that up. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, so. You can, yeah, so if we could remember the Unicode for space or non-breaking space, then we could assert it that way. Anyway. So this sort of leads us to, in a way, you know, selectors is where a lot of the action is going to be, which sounds boring as hell, but actually it's kind of interesting because you can do stuff like this. You can say, Rather, you know, I, I don't need classes. I've got titles or whatever. Um, for that matter, you can say, "Hey, I can search. I can search my classes effectively to select them." So that um, let me get, oops, let me get back to my markup. Uh, if I only want to select the stuff from this millennium, right? Then I can do a Y two O, and the Y one nines will not get picked. I don't know why I'd want to do that, but it can. Okay. So, um, yeah. Well, there's that. Any other questions? I'm going to keep going with attribute selectors, but I don't want to leave this one. I need to get one of those little Cooper's hats. Yeah. Okay. Um, Fabulous. So, I love that I got Chinese. Um, so here's uh, an example. Well, here's a, here's a case of, of, at least at the top, of using, again, attribute selectors. In this case, oops. Note to self, double clicking does not read your mind. Why did you open a BB edit? What's wrong with you? Um, I used a href starts with, because that's what caret equals means, HTTPS. Throw in a lock icon to indicate that this is a link to something secure, or at least theoretically secure. So that's where that icon comes from. In this case, I'm tossing it in as a background image. Same thing with the PDFs, which I'm, do which I'm doing in two different ways. Um, the first of these two selects using dollar sign equals, which is ends with, right? So any href that any A element whose href ends with dot PDF, like this one does, toss in a PDF document icon. The other one uh, is a substring match on the title, where in this case, because, you know, assuming that I'm working on a site where I know that thanks to the site authoring style guide, Links to PDFs always have a title information that says the size and the type of the link, then I can always search in that title. Um, and so I can do it using the third of these. It's the same basic drill, it's just keyed off of a different attribute. Um, of course, if I don't have that confidence, I've still got this particular method to fall back on because unless I'm working for one of those uber cool sites where um, none of the resources have dot extensions because we always serve things up based on the, what the browser says it can accept, like the W3C does. Who works on one of those sites, by the way? Because I never have. Um, if you're on one of those, then you can't use this. But for everybody else, since everybody always you know, links to their dot PDF or their dot DOC or their dot whatever, then we can select on that. And yes, uh, we could do exactly the same thing. If we're hosting Word document files, any a element whose href ends in .doc, throw in a Word document icon. And if it's an Excel spreadsheet, do a .xls or whatever it is that you're using. And yes, this works in Internet Explorer 7. What, uh, what does it do in IE6? It you just, the link is the link. You don't get the icon and it doesn't open up any space for it. It just fails to select. Okay. So from an IE6 point of view, it's as though these rules don't exist. So, I mean, the links work just fine. Even Sorry? Even the, padding. Even the padding, yes, because IE6 not understanding these selectors has no idea that it should be applying any of these styles to these particular links. Right. 
So if you're, if you're in a situation where it is absolutely crucial that those icons show up and you have a substantial IE6 user population, you can't do this. Sorry. Um, we can hope that that, that proportion will shrink. Um, on the other hand, you know, the question is, how crucial is it? I mean, if you're on a banking site and legal has said that you must absolutely have a lock icon on every single link that points to an HTTPS uh, um, resource, or else someone will have you in court, and if you didn't do that properly, you will be subpoenaed to testify. Don't do this, <laughs> okay? You should never do anything in CSS that will get you landed in court. That's one of my ground rules. <laughs> um, but if it's not that big a deal, if legal doesn't really care, and you know if they haven't said anything about it, don't ask them, um, <laughs> then go for it, right? Why not? Um, The links will still work, obviously. Um, of course, if it's absolutely crucial that those links, that those little lock icons, for example, show up no matter what, you should really be doing those IMG elements anyway and having alt text that says secure link or whatever, secure resource, okay? You shouldn't even be doing that in CSS if it's that crucial because, you know, what if the CSS fails to load or somebody comes in using their BlackBerry that doesn't support CSS but does show, you know, images and links. So there you go. Um, now, for those of you who have had a little flutter of joy in your heart and said to yourselves, ah, regular expressions in CSS? No. <laughs> That's about as far as it goes. Um, yeah, so they borrowed some syntax. But there's really starts with, ends with, and substring. Um, and as of the latest CSS3 selectors draft, they're really not going much further than that. Um, and I'm not, you know, there's only so many symbols that they can put up there that make sense anyway. So the other guys I have up here, the list items, actually were, were part of a test I was throwing together and I thought I would leave them in here. The first of these is the adjacent sibling combinator, the ULLI plus LI, which is select any list item that immediately follows a list item where they both share the same UL as a parent, which if you have list items in, a, in an unordered list, they're going to share as a parent, but that's okay. So uh, any list item that follows another list, uh, immediately follows another list item, make it italic, which is why two and three in that unordered list are italicized. Okay? The first one doesn't get italicized because there's no list item immediately preceding it. It's, it's the first one. Um, and then we have this, this other combinator that's, that's fairly new, and actually I was surprised to see it supported even in Firefox, um, which is the, it's not the adjacent sibling selector, but it, it's kind of hard to, to, to give it a name, even though they do in the spec, which makes no sense to me. Basically, this is the, where, where I did the ul li tilde li.test. This is going to select any list item with a class of test that has a preceding sibling of list item and they both share a parent. So basically, to, to generalize this, if I had a div and there were, there, it started with an H1 and then it had a paragraph and then there were a couple of lists and a table and another paragraph, I could do div P tilde P and that second paragraph would get selected because one of its, one of its sibling elements that it shares the same parent with that came before it was another paragraph, even though there was stuff in between them. I am hard pressed to think of practical reasons for this to exist, and yet it does. Especially when there's no equivalent combinator to say select any element that's immediately followed by a sibling. Like I can't say select any list item that's immediately followed by a sibling list item. Why that's not there, I don't know. And it kind of ticks me off. The same way that there's no parent selector and that ticks me off too, but anyway. Um, Right, if, if, if I just said div p tilde p, and then there were, yeah, there were four paragraphs throughout it, no matter what was in between them, the first one would not get selected, but all the rest would, right. Um, I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> that's the thing. I, especially since, you know, I might, say to, I might say, well, what you could do is if you actually wanted to style the first paragraph, no matter where it occurs, then you could, 
say all paragraphs should be boldface, but then any p tilde p is normal weight, right? That would be useful. Except we don't need that. Well, actually, no. What I want is p first of type, which is already supported and exists. So that's why I don't understand why that, anyway. Um, well, it's supported in some browsers, not this one, sorry. Um, but it's there, right? So there's a first of type, so I don't need the, the tilde for the, I don't know. Moving on, okay? Uh, for some reason, first of type and not first of type are not supported, but last child and not are, are supported. And so, yikes. Um, because last child, in addition to being an Aerosmith song, is a way of saying, you know, select any paragraph, in this case, which happens to be the last child element of whatever, in this case, it did with the class of type test, right? So if the paragraph happens to be the last child, which this one is, then it will get selected, and in this case, gets underlined. If there happens to be another element, like a table after that, then it won't get selected. Okay, great, fine. And then there's also the not, whatever you call that, pseudo something, where I can say any paragraph which is not a last child, give it this border. So these other paragraphs that happen to be in there get selected because they are not class children. So those are kind of cool in weird ways. Not makes my eyes bleed. Okay, so I'm just going to admit that right up front. Um, the way that the syntax for the not, whatever you call that, works out, really hurts me. Um, and one of the things that hurts me about it, particularly, is that you can really only put one thing in here. Not would have been so much more useful if you could have just put a generic selector in there, because what I want to do is I want to select every element in the document except the inputs and the selects and the options and the text areas, right? So I really want to be able to say something like star, not, input, comma, select, comma, option, comma, text area, but I can't, because you're not allowed to do group selectors, apparently. Um, the reason for this limitation is not clear to, well, I'm sorry. The reason for this limitation, there's no theoretical reason for this limitation. The reason for this limitation, so far as I can tell, is entirely due to browser uh, makers don't want to support it. They only want one thing in there. Okay, so uh, I think they should just suck, suck it up and deal with it, but whatever. Yeah? Is there any way you can group those things that you don't want selected and then plug them in? Well, yeah, unfortunately doing you know, star not input comma star not text area will select everything because everything is either not one or the other, right? Even text areas and inputs. An input is not a text area and a text area is not an input. So that particular group selector would literally be the same as saying star. Yeah, I, I had the same idea and then tried it and realized, no, that's not gonna work, sadly. Um, so I'm um, back in Camino. Well, we're in Firefox too. Um, so I mean, this is where a lot of the cool stuff is going to happen. Frankly, is, is in selectors, um, particularly stuff like this. Now, nothing's happening here. I, I recognize that, but with things like the nth child uh, pseudo class, which browser makers keep promising they're going to support any day now, this would be a checkerboard. Right, it would be a white and black checkerboard pattern just off of these rules with no classes in there at all. Supposedly, internal builds of Opera support the entirety of the CSS selectors draft, which would mean that they would support this, but nobody's seen it outside of Opera, so I have to be a little wary. Um, if this hasn't made it into Firefox 3 beta 5, I, you know, unless they take another six months to ship 3, and I have no idea whether they will or not, but I'm assuming they won't. Um, I, I assume this isn't going to make it into Firefox 3 either. But that's sort of coming. Um, and uh, I'll be interested to see what IE8 does because they promise a lot of changes. They haven't promised anything specific, but they promise a lot of changes. So, you know. Um, now. I'm sorry. I didn't see if there were other hands. Um, part of the, oops, wrong one. Part of the whole reason that I downloaded Firefox 3 in the first place was uh, because I wanted to see how it handled the pure CSS version of this. 
Um, now, this is, I'm doing, a, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a hacky trick here. Incidentally, anyone recognize what design this came from? What site? I'll be really impressed. Technorati, about three designs ago. Um, this has rounded corners, which, you know, no, I can't do that one anymore. Well, here's how they work. They're actually driven off of B elements. Yeah. Because why not visit the future by going to the past? Um, they're literally empty B elements. Um, that's what, those are what create the corners, and the TLs for top left, and the BLs for bottom left, and you could figure it out from there. Um, and in the CSS, literally, what each of those guys does is they get positioned into the appropriate corner of the box that they're in, and then pulled out by a pixel so they just overlap the borders on the boxes. The boxes have actual, like, just CSS borders. Uh, uh, they're around here somewhere. Here, I'll get rid of these guys just for a minute. Okay, so like this is just a CSS border, you know, border 1px solid, whatever. And then these guys just get pulled out, get positioned into the corners because the boxes are relatively positioned, and then they get uh, pulled out by a pixel. Yeah, outline them. Oops, did I get that wrong? Yeah. Okay, that's going to be embarrassing if that doesn't work. Come on, what do I what did I do? Misspell outline? How about border? No. <laughs> okay, now I'm confused. That's all right. Moving on. They're still there. You can tell that they're there. But each of them uses the same image. And uh, in theory, we'll see if it works. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I made them bigger. Uh, there's each of these guys has one background image that they're using, and it's just for like this particular. Uh, right now, I have them 20 by 20. Usually, they're 10 by 10, and then I just position this background image so that its bottom right corner is in the bottom right corner of this particular B element, so I only see this part of it. Woo! Okay, it's kind of icky that uh, I have to put B elements all over the markup just to make this happen, but. When I did this three years ago, there really weren't too many other choices, right? Um, now, like I say, the reason I downloaded uh, Firefox here is to see how it handles actual CSS rounded corners. This is just done in the CSS. I don't have any B elements in this markup source at all. And it's actually, oh, uh, no, they're not quite there yet. Um, you'll notice here, the, you know, basically what I did in the CSS was I said, uh, Moz border radius. Let me open it up so we can see that. There we go. Moz border radius, 11 pixels. I could do that in M's or pixels or whatever. Okay. Border radius is a proposed CSS property, but since it's still being specced out and developed, they, they put the Moz uh, vendor prefix on it so that people don't rely on it too heavily. Um, and it just rounds the corners, which is really nice. Um, and WebKit has a dash WebKit dash border dash radius. Um, the one thing that I've noticed here, though, and I don't know if WebKit's any better about this, uh, because there's a background on this H2, it's actually sticking out of, over the rounded corners, which strikes me as kind of a problem. Um, so they're not there yet, but they're getting closer because uh, in previous versions, even this, uh, in previous versions of uh, Firefox, even this background image on this box would have stuck out of the corner. They hadn't worked out the clipping quite yet. Not to mention at the time, uh, they weren't anti-aliasing, they're rounding, so it looked a little jaggy. Uh, they've worked out most of that, and they just have this one to worry about. Um, either that, or at some point, the, they'll, they'll get the spec written to say that it doesn't have to clip descendant elements, and then we'll all have to go in and like round our descendant elements just to account for this, and that will be really sucky, but we'll see. Anyway. Um, I like this much better because, as I said, um, I don't have to have those B elements littering up my markup. There, you see that they're not in there anymore. Um, but this really only works in 
like Firefox 3 and Safari if you go with a WebKit, and you still have those clipping problems, which you don't really have with this one, and this actually works in pretty much every browser that's been released this millennium. Well, the ones that are still being actively developed. I can't speak for the others. Um, including Internet Explorer. So, you know, litter up your markup or don't, whichever. Um, I guess it comes down to whether or not you're still working on a Web 2.0 site and the corners are there for a feature or a bug. And then, the, let's see. Well, so the very last thing I, I want to point out is that um, all this stuff is either is either here now or coming. But there tends to be a, a sort of a feeling that... Um, Uh-oh. Thank you. You're late by months, but it's fine. Um, this, uh, who's seen the any order columns, the in search of the one true layout, any order columns thing? Okay, so not many of you. Uh, this is a way of doing columns independent of source order. So these are ID'd uh, in terms of their source order. This is first, that second, and this is third. They're floated, and they use like wacky negative margins in order to place them where they need to be, right? It's just three divs, and they're just positioned around. And I don't really, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details. If anyone wants to talk about it later, we can. But the point is, this uses CSS1, okay? Nothing in this technique is from a draft, or uses a vendor uh, proprietary thing, or even comes from CSS2. It's all CSS1. And Alex Robinson came up with it not quite a decade after CSS1 was released. And that's why I hate him, because I didn't think of it first. <laughs> um, seriously, one of the amazing things to me still about CSS is that Despite each of the individual pieces being basically very simple, the way that they can be combined is so complex that literally a decade later, people were still figuring out ways to use CSS1 that no one had ever figured out before. Or at least if they'd figured it out, they hadn't told anyone else, so it doesn't count, right? <laughs> um, so the ways that we can use you know, CSS2, the positioning, things like that, um, you know, even though sometimes stretches of time will go by where nobody will really come up with anything new and interesting, I suspect they're still there, because this one sure was. This was sitting around forever, just waiting for someone to figure it out, and it turned out to be Alex. Um, and so that's, you know, especially with Internet Explorer for Windows under development again, and actually advancing, um, I actually I have a, a good deal of hope that in the next few years, um, especially with IE8 coming out, assuming that it is anywhere half as good as it, as it seems like it's going to be, and Firefox continue, continuing to develop and Opera and Safari and, and so on, um, that, that we're actually going to see more interesting techniques like this emerge. Um, and with any luck, they'll <coughs> kickstart the CSS working group into actually doing something again. And we might actually have advancement on a spec front as well. Um, so hopefully that was a kind of an overview of where we are and a little glimpse to where we're going. I mean, I wish I could tell you, and this particular problem will be solved, but, you know, I don't know when that will be because if you had asked me literally the day before this was published if it was possible to have any order columns using CSS1 that were independent of source without using, like, nesting divs, I would have told you there's no way. It will never happen. And I would have been totally wrong. So there's that. Uh, hopefully I have a little bit of time for questions since we started and comments and such since we started a little bit late and I think I have about nine minutes, right? Uh, yeah, we're a little bit over, but I think it's been on 53. Any other questions? Yeah, any questions or comments? Or? We got a lot of them during the, uh, during the presentation. Yeah, which was great. I really like that. Anything else you want to see? Things you want me to opine upon? We could talk politics. I... Yeah, I, I voted for uh, I voted for Hillary, but on the internet I tell people I voted for Obama. No, I'm kidding. Um, go ahead. Um, actually, I was wondering if you had found any way to do a call span, basically based off of this, because I was trying to put together a uh, basically a three-column structure with mm -hmm. uh, two cells up top, 
with one below that was column span of two, and then a column that ran um, all the way down. So, I think so that uh, first row has three cells. The third cell has a row span of two. Okay. And then the second row had, of course, one. Right. So, so sort of like this, and then these two guys here, but um, push these guys down, and then you have a box across here. Right. Uh, I would do that all with floats. In fact, I, I did uh, earlier this week. Um, and I wish I could show you that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, the the site I did, um, and this wasn't on all pages either. Um, but on a, on a few pages, there was the, a sidebar, which had the nav links and other stuff. And then on these on these other pages, there was. Um, the strip across the top that had the sort of sublinks that were huge, but what you know, what can you do? And then there was the main content column and another sidebar. I mean, basically, what I did was um, just given the way that it was all set up, I just this stripe got stuck in between these two, and given that particular width, and there you go. I mean, that's how I did it. Well, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Yes, no, maybe. You just want me out of here. I can tell. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. Well, thank you very much for your attention and your questions. <laughs>